it on Piazza, so the links are there. Um, I'd be really curious to see whether you find those useful, because if you do, I'll do some more before the end of the year for some of the other quiz, because obviously it gets more challenging a little bit as you go through the quizzes. Um, so I'm happy to do that, but if it's not helpful, then obviously I won't. <laughs> so, um, yeah. My understanding is you will get past papers, but that is a question to ask Kate, probably. Um, no, no, absolutely, good question. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, maybe post it on the piazza, um, and that'll remind me to have a look into that and see whether we can get them out sooner rather than later. Great. Okay, all right. Um, like I said, we've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to kick off sooner rather than later. Any quick questions or concerns before we get going? Good. Okay, all right. Well, firstly, thank you all for making it again uh, on a Monday morning at 9 a.m. Always appreciated. Um, the Mentimeter question, um, most of you all agree that it's B. A couple of people have said E. The short answer is, I don't know what the right answer is. It would, we don't really have enough information to figure out which is the hottest spacecraft in this scenario. The point that I really wanted to make is that it's not always easy to work out which is going to be the most extreme thermal environment for your spacecraft, and that there's lots of different parameters that play into it. So, for example, uh, E has a much bigger surface area pointing towards the sun, so it's going to end up taking in a lot more thermal energy from the sun. Um, D and B are the same distance from the sun, but they're different colors. And the color that a spacecraft is is going to impact how much of different types of radiation it actually absorbs and therefore how hot it gets. Uh, a, I'm pretty sure, is not the hottest. It's out here on its own. It's probably, it's probably grand. Um, C is further away from the sun than the other ones, but it's close to the Earth. And as we'll see today, what that means is that it'll actually absorb some heat energy from its proximity to the Earth as well. So. I agree with you. I think B is probably the worst off, um, but uh, possibly E. Um, but we don't really have enough information to find out because there are lots of different things we have to take into account when we do a thermal analysis. Um, good. Okay, right. So let's kick things off. So here is where we are. We are looking at the thermal subsystem. Uh, and yeah, this is what we're going to be covering. So we're going to be looking at the different um, thermal inputs and uh, heat loss mechanisms. So basically, why does your spacecraft get hot and cold? Um, we're going to do some basic equilibrium equations to try and estimate some of the worst case scenarios for your spacecraft's temperature. Um, and then we're going to look at some methods for thermal control. So if we find out our spacecraft is going to be too hot or too cold, how do we actually address that and make sure it will be OK in space? Uh, this um, is a little video. Uh, I wonder, will it run, actually? It's always fun to, to test the IT first thing on a Monday morning. Uh, go away. Go away. And once again, go away. <laughs> okay. This is by uh, NASA, so it's typically American dramatic. So this is Solar Orbiter, it's one of our spacecraft that views the sun, and what I wanted to show you was that heat shield on the front with the little windows where all the instruments look out at the sun, because to protect them from the sun because it's so close to it, it has to have this big heat shield on the front and then like little holes for like the cameras to open out and then close them up again before they get too hot. So um, yeah, it's one of the more challenging um, spacecraft we've had to build from a thermal perspective. Uh, there's a couple of others that are quite tough. And um, Bepi Colombo as well is another one. Um, but yeah, basically going to the sun is hard um, and, and dramatic. Right, okay, so that was just to, to wake you all up first thing. Alrighty, so um, basics before we get going too far. Hopefully none of this is unfamiliar to you, but 
There are three mechanisms for heat transfer that we need to worry about. The first is conduction. Conduction is when you have heat being transferred physically between molecules in contact, right? So if you have a metal rod, you heat it at one end, you hold the other, you burn your hand. Equally, pan on a hob that's been heated on a gas flame, you grab the handle, your hand is burned, right? So conduction. We require physical contact. Convection is when we have heat transfer via a fluid, right? So again, so if you're heating a pot, of boil, a hot pot of water, you're heating it at the bottom, but the heat moves through it through the motion of the fluid. So the water heats, the hot water rises, the cold water sinks, and through that motion of convection, we get heat being transferred through the fluid. Yes? So convection is heat being transferred by fluid motion and mixing. Correct. And uh, the third one is radiation. So radiation is essentially infrared. So it's radiation in the same way that light is radiation. It doesn't need a medium to travel through, but it is heat being transmitted as an electromagnetic wave, uh, potentially through a vacuum, right? So it doesn't need something in contact. It doesn't need a fluid or a solid. Now, when we're in space, we don't tend to have a lot of fluid. <laughs> so we don't tend to have a lot of convection going on. So really what we're worried about is radiation and to a much lesser extent, conduction. So if we think about our thermal environment, this is what it looks like. So we've got our satellite in orbit around our planet, in this case Earth, for example. It might not be in orbit around anything. It might be some, or sorry, it will always be in orbit around something, but it might be in orbit around the sun in the case of something like solar orbiter. Um, but these are the sort of main things that we need to consider. So the first one is that we have solar radiation. So this is uh, radiation being emitted by the sun um, across a whole range of wavelengths that will hit our uh, spacecraft and heat it up. So in the same way, if you're standing outside on a sunny day, you will feel warmer in the sun than you will in the shade. Right? So it's that same type of radiation. Additionally, we have radiation being emitted by the Earth. And this is infrared radiation. So this is basically because the Earth itself has a temperature. So if you think about if you've got the radiator, well, actually, radiators are probably not a great example because radiators work by convection. But there are actually these newfangled uh, heating things um, called heating panels that you can get for, for houses and buildings where they're basically these big panels that have an electric current through them and they generate infrared radiation. So if you touch them, they don't feel that hot. There's no convection happening. They're not heating the air around them. They're producing pure infrared radiation. Um, I guess maybe the best example is if you've ever seen someone who's gone out for like a run or something like that, and uh, they come back in and you can almost feel the heat coming off them, right? Because they're so warm and they're much warmer than you. So that is infrared radiation basically coming off people. Um, and the earth itself has a temperature, so therefore it emits infrared radiation. And the third thing is albedo radiation. Now, albedo radiation is basically when the sun hits the Earth, it reflects off the Earth and bounces back. So some of the sun gets absorbed by the planet, by the atmosphere, but some of it bounces off. It's reflected by the atmosphere and by the surface of the Earth. Um, and that is what we call albedo radiation. So that light that gets, or that radiation that gets reflected off the Earth and hits our spacecraft is albedo radiation. And it's actually quite significant. Um, when you think about, I guess, the whole thing about greenhouse gases and how we need to protect our ozone layer, part of that is because it absorbs and reflects the radiation from the sun, right? So, um, so it's protecting us on Earth, but also it reflects some stuff back into space. So all of those forms of heat transfer are in the form of radiation, right? Our satellite's not touching the Earth, it's not touching the sun, so there's no conduction happening, and there's no fluid, right? We're assuming space is a vacuum for all intents and purposes, and so it's only radiation that we're dealing with. And in some ways, that makes our life quite simple. The corollary of this is that when our spacecraft is giving out heat, so when it's radiating heat out, it is only doing it through radiation as well. The reason this is a good thing is it makes our lives simple because calculating the heat transfer via uh, convection is actually quite challenging because as you'll know from your fluids classes, fluids are funny. Um, so it makes the kind of thermal balance and the equations that we're considering more simple to understand. But the downside is radiation is not a very effective way of transmitting heat. 
So if you think about when we're trying to heat things up, um, conduction and convection is how we generally do it, right? So we tend to boil water. Um, you know, if you think about radiators, they have fluid in them that's moving through the radiators to carry that heat around. So convection is a really good form of heat transfer. Radiation, not so much. And that means we're really limited in what we can do to kind of change the thermal properties of our spacecraft and help to protect them if they are going to be in an extreme thermal environment. I did mention that conduction does come into it as well. Uh, we won't look at this in particular um, in this course, but it's worth knowing that within the spacecraft itself, you will get conduction happening. So from the spacecraft to its environment, it's going to be radiating, right? Because it's got those surfaces, there's nothing touching it. But within the spacecraft, if you've got like a computer, so like your laptops, and it gets really hot, the way the heat moves from that out to the surfaces of the spacecraft and then into deep space is generally by conduction. So that computer will be sitting on top of a circuit board. That circuit board will be connected to the structure of the spacecraft through these kind of metal edges, for example, and that will allow heat to move through the spacecraft out to the edges of the panels and then out into deep space. And so we'll look again, as I say, probably on Thursday, um, about how we can control the heat, that's ha the heat that's coming into our spacecraft and going out. Um, but within the spacecraft, it's by tweaking the conductive paths around the spacecraft that we can control the temperatures within it and help to make sure that we don't end with like our computer being stupidly hot and our, I don't know, our camera being really, really cold. So we can use these conductive pathways to help move the heat around the spacecraft and keep everything nice and balanced. Okay, so on that note, I'm going to pop you back over to the Mentimeter and ask you, what do you think is the most significant natural thermal input that we need to consider? So those are your three options up there, solar radiation, earth shine, or earth IR. So that's the radiation that I said is coming from the earth, um, or albedo, that reflected light. Okay, good. I'll just give you like 60 more seconds because I don't think this one is causing too much consternation. <coughs> nope, people still coming in. Give me like five more seconds, last answers. Okay, good. So most people have said uh, solar radiation, um, but you'll notice I haven't put a right answer for this question. And the reason I haven't done it is that I don't think it's necessarily immediately obvious. So again, it does depend a little bit on where your spacecraft is, what it's doing, how it's designed, what color it is, all sorts of things. But it is worth keeping in mind that even for a spacecraft that's in very low Earth orbit, so very close to the Earth where it's getting the, the most of that albedo and Earth radiation effect, uh, the solar radiation is going to be far more significant. So it's just worth keeping that in mind. We'll see that as we go through um, looking at each of these in detail. You'll see how the, the, the numbers are kind of an order of magnitude of difference. Um, but, like I say, that's not necessarily obvious from the information that I've given you, so I don't think there's a right or wrong answer at this point. Um, but it is worth knowing. And, of course, if you're in eclipse, for example, then your solar radiation isn't going to affect you at all. So if for some inexplicable reason you had a satellite that was always in eclipse, then it would never experience any solar radiation, at which point that wouldn't be the dominant one. Okay, next question then. What are we missing? Again, feel free to chat, have a think. There's something missing from this picture. What am I missing? <laughs> 
Mm. Some interesting answers. I always love when I give you these kind of questions because you always come up with something that I've never thought of before. So there's a couple of people saying things like, um, you know, background radiation, uh, you know, uh, cosmic microwave background, Van Allen belts. That's a really good thought. I hadn't thought about that. Um, but they're a different type of radiation. So because of the, uh, the wavelengths that they're at and the type of radiation they are, they're not contributing to the thermal um, to the thermal equation that our, our spacecraft is experiencing. Uh, they're far more problematic. So they're basically. <laughs> They're not electromagnetic radiation, they're like um, loose electrons and, and protons and things that are gonna cause problems for our spacecraft electronics. Um, but well spotted as something to be thinking about. It was, uh, people said the cosmic microwave background. Like that is, I suppose, uh, radiation, um, as in, uh, in the electromagnetic sense. But yeah, it's much too um, low a value to actually contribute in this case. Uh, so the cosmic microwave background is electromagnetic radiation, but it's much too low to impact. Okay, so some of the interesting things that you've mentioned. Uh, the first one is the moon, right? Which is a good point, actually. I haven't included the moon in this. And I haven't included the moon because basically I'm focused on uh, an Earth orbiting spacecraft because that's what most of our spacecraft do. But absolutely, if you were in orbit around the moon, you would then need to account for the moon's albedo. Um, and I don't know whether the I've never done a, a lunar orbiting spacecraft. I'd need to look into that as to whether the, the moon has um, sort of enough of a, a stable temperature to be emitting infrared radiation or whether it's like you know, very, very cold. Um, but yeah, good point. The moon uh, would absolutely be relevant for when you're doing Earth orbiting spacecraft. Uh, obviously, the moon's moving as well, which makes things difficult. Um, and we're not that close to the moon, so we tend to just ignore the moon. But yes, if you were in orbit around the moon, that would be a really important one to consider. Um, what else have people said? Actually, this one's quite interesting. I didn't really think of this, which is uh, friction in the lower atmosphere. So things like uh, impact from drag. Um, and that's absolutely true. You absolutely would get heating from friction. Um, again, normally when we're launching spacecraft, we launch them high enough that we can ignore that atmospheric drag uh, friction um, and the heating that it would cause. It would only be very, very small until you're at the point where your spacecraft is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and going to burn up when obviously it becomes significant. But we tend to be designing our spacecraft to be destroyed in that case, not to survive it. Um, unless there's astronauts inside, we do want them to survive. Um, so that's really good. Uh, and then the other ones, which is what I was looking for, um, is things like thrusters, power dissipation, components on board heating up. Um, but I really love, I'll put all these on the, on the blackboard as well, because I really love all the ideas you've come up with. Um, but that's what I was looking for, was this power dissipation, because this is the main one that we need to consider, which is our contribution to that thermal environment. So if we have a computer on board, if we have thrusters in particular, they will get very hot, um, and all of that is going to contribute to the thermal environment of our spacecraft. So if we have very, very hot components on board, we need to figure out a way to dump that heat out of our spacecraft so that it doesn't overheat. Okay. Uh, any quick questions before I move on to the next section? Or long questions? Yes? How do you build for solar flares or like unexpected Sure, so that's a great question. So there's a couple of things really around things like solar flares and the sort of solar behavior. Um, so Ultimately, there, there's a whole load of variables. And actually, what I'm going to show you go, in a second will show just how simplistic we go in a lot of these analyses. Um, essentially, it's a, it's a choice based on what you're doing as to how detailed and how precise you go with your thermal analysis. So for something like solar orbiter, where you're going very close to the sun, you probably want to try and account for things like um, the solar cycle, where you might have more radiation coming off at certain times, uh, at certain different years. Um, you might want to account for what's the worst case of these solar flares happening, because obviously they're difficult to predict, and will that impact the temperature of your spacecraft? Um, to be honest, for things like solar flares, what you tend to more have to deal with is, again, electrons and protons, high energy particles flying off the sun, which are likely to knock out your spacecraft. They're probably a bigger problem than that minor spike in, in thermal. 
because what we tend to be looking at is the average over an orbit or over a, a couple of cycles of the spacecraft. Um, but it's a good point, and it really is a question of how much detail do you want to put into your thermal analysis. Thermal analysis is, by its nature, a little bit wishy-washy um, and hard to predict, and so we tend to try and average things. And as you'll see when we look at what the intensity of solar radiation is at the Earth, we've got a nice round number, yeah, which obviously is going to vary depending on what orbit you're in, how far the Sun is, or how far the Earth is from the Sun throughout its orbit, and all these kind of things. So we tend to take a lot of averages um, and use that to, to get our answers. Great question. Yep. Uh, why is power dissipation not negligible? Why is power dissipation not negligible? Um, so I guess that would depend a little bit on what power you had on board. So if you had a spacecraft that was very large and wasn't generating an awful lot of power, then you could possibly ignore it. Um, but in most cases, you're densely packing your spacecraft because you want your spacecraft to be as small as possible and as light as possible to get it into orbit, right? Because that's cheaper. And so what that tends to mean is that you have an awful lot of electrical components all stacked on top of each other, and we don't tend to put them in if we don't need them. So there's a good chance pretty much everything is turned on. And when you're talking about things like thrusters, which could be drawing on the order of like a kilowatt, for example, for the time that they're turned on, in the space of a spacecraft that could be like, you know, 150 kilos, so this kind of size, half a meter across, has a lot of power being generated. And because we only have radiation to dispel that energy, it's very slow to get rid of it. So we have to account for that. Great question. Good, okay. So as one of your colleagues mentioned, there's a lot of detail we could choose to include in our thermal analysis. One of the things uh, which I think is the most obvious element is the fact that if we're in an orbit around the Earth, there is a good chance that we will go into eclipse at some point. Right? So we're not just going to be sitting at static in this picture as the little blue spacecraft is. We're going to be moving around our orbit, passing through eclipse and then back out into the sun. And as that happens, your uh, spacecraft thermal environment is going to change. It's going to heat up and cool down. And as well as that, you're going to be turning equipment on and off. That's what I'm trying to show by the little dot going red. Um, you know, so you might have a thruster on, you might not. You might have your communication system, you might not. And so there's going to be lots of variation in your power throughout the orbit. We don't tend to account for this. And the reason is, well, sorry, we do, but we're not going to do it here. Basically, if you want to try and account for these kind of cycles of what is changing, it's quite a difficult thing to do. Um, you need to use numerical models. There's specific pieces of software for doing this, or uh, you can do your own software and your own analysis, and I believe that's what you're going to do in the coursework related to this. Um, but in terms of taking a first guess and doing a first order solution, we try and ignore time because it's, it's tricky to try and capture in terms of doing approximations. And so instead what we do is we calculate equilibrium temperatures. So what we do is pretend our satellite is fixed at one point and then we calculate, okay, where is the sun, where is the earth, where are all the different elements that we're interested in and imagine that it stayed there for long enough that, that, that it reached a stable temperature, right? It was in thermal balance. There was a balance of heat going in and out, and therefore it reached a constant temperature and stayed that temperature. And we work out what that temperature is. And I'll talk a little bit about this, I think, on Thursday. But the way we tend to do it is we do a worst case and a best case. So we think about what if our satellite was sitting in eclipse with no power on, for example, how cold could it possibly get? That's the absolute worst case that could happen to it. And what about if it was sitting in the sun uh, with albedo and earth shine and everything was turned on? How hot could it possibly get? And if you know your satellite can survive those two temperatures, then you're grand. Don't need to worry too much about it, right? Um, if you're starting to get very, very hot and very, very cold, um, then you do need to think about what that means um, and whether you can account for this in your thermal cycles or whether you need to start thinking about adding other controls, putting other things in place to make sure that your spacecraft can survive. All right, so um, equilibrium temperature. So this is the kind of baseline for all of the calculations that we're going to do, is we assume that our satellite is in equilibrium, so it has a constant temperature. So we're imagining it's kind of fixed in space, it's not moving, and it's got a fixed temperature. And if that is true, the only way that that can be true is if all of the heat energy coming out is equal to the heat, sorry, all the heat energy coming in 
is equal to all of the heat energy going out, right? Because if you had more heat going out than you had coming in, your satellite would cool down. And if you had more heat coming in than you had going out, your satellite would heat up. And we're saying it's not doing any of those things. It's fixed. It has a fixed temperature. So this is the basic, basic assumption for all of the calculations that we do. All right? So as I say, you can go on and do far more complicated uh, versions of this. You can do them with eclipse and timing and all that kind of stuff taken into account, uh, cycling. But for the most basic elements, this is what we use. All right, so we said we've got our heat inputs and they need to balance our heat outputs. And so what we end up with is something that looks a little bit like this. So we've got the heat coming in from each of our sources. So we've got the heat coming in from the sun. We've got the heat coming in from our albedo reflection. We've got the heat coming in from our earth infrared. We've got the heat from the power that's being dissipated on board. And then we've got the heat going out of our spacecraft. And that is all the terms that we need in our equation. That is how we need to balance it. And then to solve for our temperature, we just need to work out each one of these terms. Okay, so the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to go through each one individually and talk you through them because each one has a little bit of a subtlety. Um, and so we're going to go through them individually and then re we're going to return to it all at the end and hopefully it will all make sense. I don't think I'm going to get through all of it today. I think I'm going to have to roll over into Thursday. So I think this is the only class I've given you where I think I might have to genuinely stop like mid-sentence. Well, not quite mid-sentence, but you know what I mean. Um, so we'll get as far as we can today, but there's some complexities in this and I want to make sure that it's clear to you all. Okay? All right, any questions at this stage? Or are we ready to dive into the nitty gritty? Yes? Correct. I like that. That's an excellent way to put it. Good. All right, I'm going to take a big swig of coffee. Everybody take a deep breath, and we're going to get ready to go. All right, nodding. We're all awake. We're all ready. Excellent. Good, let's do it. All right, so the first one we're going to start off with is solar radiation, right? We'll just work our way from left to right, and we're going to get through these all. So, uh, a couple of subtleties around solar radiation. So, the first thing is, uh, as someone pointed out already, this could be, you know, solar radiation is going to vary over time, it's going to vary with different events, it's going to vary depending on where the Earth is uh, in the year, for example, because the Earth's orbit is elliptical and it'll move further away and closer to the Sun. But for all intents and purposes, we sort of iron out all of those, uh, those sort of wibbles for our first order approximation. And we say that the value of so the intensity of solar radiation at the Earth is 1,400 watts per meter squared. So what does that mean? That means that if you have an object at the Earth, then the amount of energy from the sun falling on it is 1,400 watts per meter squared of that object, right? So if your object is one meter squared, it has 1,400 watts falling onto it. And if your object is two meters squared, then it has... Uh, 2,800 watts falling onto it, right? So depending on how big the area is that's in view of the sun, more radiation is going to fall onto it. We also assume that the sun is infinitely far away. And the reason that's relevant is basically we don't worry about the angle of our spacecraft towards the sun, right? So it doesn't really matter where we are in orbit around the Earth. As long as we're not in eclipse, we assume that we're in full view of the sun, okay? Just because the sun is... Uh, you know, almighty. Um, that's basically the, the kind of assumption here. And of course, if we are in eclipse, so if we are on the dark side of the Earth, then there is no solar radiation striking our spacecraft in that scenario. So as I mentioned, the, I, I can't think of any scenario where you would have a spacecraft that just sat in eclipse. It wouldn't seem like a particularly interesting space mission. Um, but for our cold case, when we're thinking about the worst case scenario, this is normally what we would assume was that we were sitting in eclipse for an extended period of time and we would look at how cold our spacecraft would get. Yes? So, so, ah. so we assume that the whole eclipse shine thing is black and white, i.e. eclipse, no lights at all, not eclipse, maximum intensity. Excellent, yes, exactly that, great point. So it is eclipse or not eclipse. There is no half eclipse. Obviously, you could be sort of half shadowed, but that would be for a split second as you move through your orbit. So we don't consider it. You're either in eclipse or you're not. It's a binary, it's a binary function. 
Right. So we've said that we've got, uh, that, that's the solar energy that's hitting us, so that's the first thing. The second thing then is we need to think about, well, what about our spacecraft? What surface is actually being exposed to that radiation? So the first thing that we need to think about is that, that area, right? So we said that the solar radiation that's hitting us is in watts per meter squared. So we need to know what that area is. What meter squared do we have facing the sun that's actually absorbing this solar radiation? All right, so if we've got something like a cube, for example, we're not looking at every face, we're just looking at the face that's pointing towards the sun, right? Because obviously the back of it is shadowed, and if you imagine it was face on exactly, then the top would be shadowed, the sides would be shadowed, and only that face that's pointing towards the sun would be exposed to it. Now, the subtlety to this is, what we're actually calculating is not the area that's facing the sun, it's the projected area that's facing the sun. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is, if I had my coffee cup, for example, uh, and let's say you're all the sun, so I've got this sort of rounded surface facing the sun, I don't need to calculate the area of the curved surface. What I need to calculate is the projected area. So if I took a slice through it, what would that area be? Yeah, so it's a bit like if I squished it flat, how much area would be facing the sun at that point. And the reason that helps us out is that it doesn't matter in this case then whether like our cube is kind of side on a little bit or corner on or whatever, it's always going to have the same area facing the sun, yeah, because it's that projected area that's sliced through. So we can use that to help us out. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm. Right, okay, excellent question. So satellites with irregular shapes, you're basically, again, taking what is the largest... So let's imagine, right, you've got a satellite which is some sort of weird irregular shape. It's got bits sticking out of it. It looks something like this thing, right? Imagine that you shone a torch on the side of that spacecraft and looked at what its shadow was on the wall directly behind it, yeah? That is the projected area. So it might have bits that are further back, bits that are further in front, bits that are sticking out. It's imagine that you flattened it, yeah? So it's that projected area, regardless of what shape it is. It's whatever the projected area is that's looking at the sun. If you were, that's assuming it's fixed, pointing at the sun. If you have something irregular like this and it's rotating, what we would normally do is kind of take six sides, so imagine it's a cube, it's not obviously, but imagine you've got a cube kind of shape to it, calculate the area for each side and then average it assuming that it's spinning either around one axis or just tumbling randomly. So again, it's the level of detail that you want to go into, but that's normally how we would approach it. Okay. Yes? So our projected area is the average of, every, of each and every side's projected area? No, our projected area is just the projected area of the side facing the sun, unless we have a tumbling spacecraft. And that's the tumbling spacecraft thing I was talking about. Okay, good. Just checking we're on the same page. Yeah, so for a rotating aircraft, our projected area is the average of each and every projected area at any point on the face of the cube. There is one exception to that on rotating spacecraft. The exception to that is you often get something called a spin-stabilized spacecraft. A spin-stabilized spacecraft, I think you might have done something on it, I can't remember, you certainly do it, I think, in ADCS if you haven't already, is when you have a spacecraft that's round, like a cylinder, and it spins around that axis, yeah? So a bit like my coffee cup, this is a dangerous game, um, but that's spinning around this axis. If that spacecraft spinning around that axis is pointing towards the sun, so if the sun was above it, your projected area would just be this face, right? Because that's what's looking at the sun. If the sun was over here and your spacecraft is spinning, we actually assume that the area is the full surface area of the spacecraft because it's all being exposed to the sun. And I actually have uh, an image of this. I don't think I have it in this slide deck. I think I have it for Thursday, but I will revisit it on Thursday, where basically people have done thermal models and they basically show that as the spacecraft spins, the heat basically gets spread evenly around the surface. So we assume that it's the full area, as though you almost unwrapped it, and that that's the area. So if you're spinning side on to the sun, 
that is the exception to the rule. Great question. Yes. I think so. I'm just trying to think about it, but... It feels weird, but, like, that's, that seems I think it could be, yeah. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure I said it, and then I was like, actually, is that true in every single case? Possibly not. Um, but I think so, because I think we do that for CubeSats, and they're, they're by definition cubes. Um, but again, it's a matter of how much detail you want to go in through with your thermal analysis, whether you want to be precise or whether you just want to make assumptions. Fortunately, most spacecraft are three-axis stabilized, right? So we tend to know where they're pointing, which does help. Okay. So we've got our uh, energy coming from the sun and arriving at our spacecraft. We've got the area that that energy is hitting. And the last thing that we need to account for is the absorptance. So that is, we know what area is being displayed to the sun. We know what energy is hitting that area, but not all of that energy is going to be absorbed. So this little diagram here is supposed to show a surface and radiation striking that surface. And what happens is that some of it will pass through that surface and get absorbed into the spacecraft. Some of it will actually be absorbed by the surface material. For our purposes, that's obviously still going into the spacecraft. For something like a window, um, if you were using this for thermal analysis of a window, some of it gets absorbed in the window, so it doesn't pass through. Um, but for our purposes, everything that goes through here is going into the spacecraft, but some of it will get reflected away. So in the same way that some uh, solar radiation gets reflected off the Earth as albedo, some incoming solar radiation will bounce off the surface of our spacecraft and get sent back into space. And how much gets sent off into space depends on basically two things. It depends on the wavelength of the energy that's being um, fired at the spacecraft, as it were, and it depends on the color of the spacecraft itself. So uh, what this is trying to show you, and again, the, the graph is in your notes, so you can dig into it in a little more detail, is if you had a perfect black body, so this is, yeah, but, well, well, it sounds like perfect black body, it would absorb all radiation. Nothing would bounce off the surface. But in reality, different amounts will bounce off at different wavelengths. So this red line here is white paint. And what we can see is that it'll absorb most of the UV radiation, but it'll reflect a lot of visible light and infrared and then it'll absorb again at these other uh, wavelengths down here. And then for gold, it will absorb UV, but then will reflect pretty much everything else. So depending on what color your paint is uh, on your spacecraft, you will absorb and reflect different values of light. And so what we do is that for a type of solar radi or for a type of radiation, we will calculate what is the absorptivity of that material. So for example, and this is one of the main ways that we control the temperatures of our spacecraft, is we use something like black paint and white paint, right? And so what we will say is that for black paint, it will absorb a certain amount of solar radiation, and for white paint, it will absorb a different amount of solar radiation, generally less, right? Because we can see there's this big dip here. So solar radiation will have different wavelengths in it, so someone has gone away and calculated and integrated across all these wavelengths to work out how much actually gets absorbed by the spacecraft. And so that absorptance factor is going to be between zero and one. So zero, you don't absorb any of it, all of it gets reflected away. One, you absorb all of the energy that's hitting you. Um, and you're talking about something like for black paint, you tend to be on the order of 0 0.9, 0 0.93, that kind of value. Uh, for white paint, somewhere down around the 0 0.2, 0 0.3, depending on what, what kind of paint you're using. Okay, and that, we, we stick all of those together. So we've got our solar intensity at Earth, which is our 1400 watts per meter squared. We've got then how much of that is actually absorbed as a, uh, rate, as a value from 0 to 1. And then we've got the area of the spacecraft that's projected to the sun. Multiply all those together, and we get the heat energy that's actually being absorbed by the spacecraft in watts. Questions? I'll give you a second to breathe. Nope. Everybody happy? <laughs> <laughs>
Good. Okay, I will say I really recommend for these to work through a couple of examples, especially go through the quiz and things like that, because once you go through it, it'll start to make a lot more sense. Um, and until you work through the subtleties of it, it's a bit tricky to figure everything out. Okay, let's move on to the next one, because I'd like to at least get albedo done before we roll out of here. So albedo, so we've already explained a little bit what albedo is. It is the radiation that's being reflected from a planet. So to calculate what that is, we basically take the solar intensity, because that's what's being reflected, right? It's the solar energy. And we work out what fraction of it is actually being reflected. So for Earth, it's something on the order of 30%. So we multiply that value by 0 0.3 to get the total albedo. Yes? This AR, no, this AR is albedo reflectance. So it is the proportion of the solar radiation hitting the Earth, which is reflected away. OK, so we get something that looks a little bit like this. So we've got the sun shining on the Earth. We've got this uh, solar radiation bouncing off the Earth and hitting our spacecraft. Here we go for the subtleties. So the first bit is we've worked out what intensity that radiation is going to be that's being reflected off the Earth in total, right? So it's some percentage of that solar radiation. The second thing is, which we've already looked at, but we're going to look at again, is we need to think about the projected area. This time, the projected area that is facing the Earth, right? So because the, um, the albedo is coming from the Earth, not from the Sun, we need the projected area that is facing the Earth. So in this case, that small uh, square face would be facing the Sun, but this long face will be facing the Earth. Right? So we need to make sure we're using the right area to calculate the different values. And then we need to add in our uh, absorptance again. Our albedo is solar radiation that's been reflected. Nothing's happened to it. It's not been transformed. It's not, been, you know, it's not had its wavelength shifted. Nothing magic has happened to it. It's the same type of radiation, so our absorptance will be the same. So if we said that our white paint um, was absorbing, uh, or sorry, yeah, it was absorbing 0 0.2, um, like, well, blah, blah, right. If we said our white paint was absorbing 20%, of the solar radiation coming in from the sun, it will also absorb 20% of the albedo being reflected because it's the same type of radiation. Yes. Yep. So the real object, you're talking about satellites, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so this is all the stuff that we looked at before. So we've got that intensity of our solar radiation. We've got this albedo value, which is telling us how much gets reflected off the Earth. We've got that absorptance value, which tells us how much gets absorbed by the satellite. And then we've got our projected area, this time the projected area towards the planet, because albedo is coming from the planet. Questions on that? Nope. Yes. So great question. So we're going to come on to that bit in a second. We do have to account for all of that. But the AR is just telling us how much gets reflected back off the planet. So we're not worrying about where our satellite is yet. We're going to look at that in a second. We're just looking at, basically, it's telling us 70% of that sun's energy goes into the planet and 30% doesn't. What happens to that? We have to worry about in a second. Great. Good. OK, so let's get on to that to answer that question. Oh, there's my spacecraft area pointing towards the sun. Right, so as your colleague has rightly pointed out, just because 30% of the solar radiation is being bounced off the planet doesn't mean all of that is going to hit our satellite. Because if you think about it, if, uh, well, if we're behind the planet, um, no albedo is going to hit us, right? If we're in eclipse, there's no albedo because the solar radiation can't bounce backwards. It doesn't work like that. If we're off at 90 degrees, 
We're also not really going to get any albedo because we're kind of off at a right angle. And if you think about light shining off a mirror or a, or a ball bouncing off a surface, right, trying to get a 90 degree bounce is not really something that we can do very easily. right? So, so if we're over here and it's reflecting here, trying to get albedo over there is not really going to work. So we need to account for the angle between the line of the sun and the line of the reflection up to our satellite. So if our satellite was here between the sun and the earth, then it would get that full force of reflected albedo. But when it's off to the side, we have to account for that angle between them and reduce our albedo by that value, as you correctly pointed out. Okay, And just to add another complication, so this is assuming that we're looking down at the sun, the top of the sun, the Earth, and our spacecraft. You can also look at it from the side, and our satellite might be in an inclined orbit, for example, and off at an angle that way, and then we would have to account for that angle as well. Yeah. So depending on where our satellite is, we're going to get different values of reflectance. So basically what you want to just think about is how that solar energy is almost being rotated through angles through X and Y. And we can use, we use the cos of them, basically, right? So if that angle is zero, we're getting the full blast because cos of zero is one. And if that angle is 90, then we're getting none of it because it's gone out the other side. So that's exactly what you just said, yep. Yeah. All right, last subtlety for albedo. This is the worst one, so brace yourselves. There's one other thing that we have to take into account, and this is something we call the view factor. Now, this is basically where I said before that we imagine that the sun is infinitely far away and it is all seeing and just blasts energy out into everywhere. We can't assume that for the Earth. So we have to take into account what happens as we move further away from the Earth. And what basically the view factor is, is it tells us the proportion of radiation that comes from one surface and hits another. So I find this diagram on the right the easiest one to kind of understand, which is if you imagine that that's the curved surface of the Earth, some of the radiation is going to get blasted off slightly to the side, and some of it is going to go straight up. So if this is all the radiation being blasted out from the surface of the Earth, then some of it is going to miss our spacecraft. So if you imagine that this is our spacecraft and it's like, uh, let's say that, whee, whoops, reverse, reverse. Let's imagine that that's one meter square, right? So the face of our spacecraft is a one meter square. And then we're calculating the radiation that's coming out from a one meter square blob on the surface of the Earth. If it was flat, then all of that would just fly up and hit, hit our spacecraft, right? But it's not. So some of it is being sent off to the sides. And if our spacecraft was really close to the Earth, pretty much all that radiation was hidden. But the further we go away, the more of it is kind of going slightly off to the sides. That angle stays the same, but the distance it goes to the side gets bigger, and so not as much actually hits our spacecraft. So we don't take this into account for the sun because we assume the sun is magic and, well, not magic, but all-seeing all is how I think about it. Um, but for the Earth, we don't give it that power. So we have to account for this view factor. And we have some equations that we can use to do this. So whether it is a, a flat plate off at an angle or we also have some for a sphere. Uh, again, these are in your notes. I'm not going to go massively into the detail. But what I do want to show you, because I think this helps with the logic of it, is that basically... What matters is the altitude of your spacecraft and the radius of the planet, right? So we're thinking about the curvature of the planet almost and the altitude of your satellite. And if you imagine that your altitude is really, really big, so you're really, really far from the Earth in this case, and if you imagine that your angle, your spacecraft's not tilted, so it's looking straight at the Earth, then you reduce the equation down and it actually becomes the same as the power law that you saw for the intensity of solar radiation at the Earth. So you should have done this, I think, in week one. I can't remember. It's definitely in your notes in week one um, that we worked out how much, that, in fact, that 1400 number, right? That 1400 watts per meter squared that gets to the Earth from the sun was it came off by um, an intensity law, right? So as the distance was squared, the, the intensity dropped as a function of that distance squared. That is basically your view factor if everyone's pointing in the same direction, right? So 
it's essentially the same thing. That basically, the further away you get from something, the less energy hits it. That is probably the nastiest bit. Uh, yes, <laughs> this is all examinable. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. So this one here with the dot in the middle of the circle is the symbol for the sun. Great, good question. Uh, and the one up here with the cross in it is for the radius of the Earth, which is just because I I'm doing this as an example for a comparison, but generally speaking, we're going to be dealing with things in orbit around the Earth. Okay, so we've done solar radiation, we've done albedo. I promise uh, Earth IR is not as bad as albedo, so you've got the worst out of the way. Um, but we will do that on Thursday to finish out this whole process, and we'll look at how we actually deal with these temperatures once we know what they are. Okay? Uh, so that's the worst out of the way, I promise. Yeah? All right, thank you all for your attention, and I will see you on Thursday morning. Bye. The short answer is I have no idea. It could be for thermal reasons um, to try and absorb more heat, for example, because um, it would absorb a little bit more than the white paint, I guess. Uh, but I have no idea. Could be that. Could just be a manufacturing thing that they're not actually too worried about the thermal environment and therefore they're just like, yeah, whatever color it is, that's fine. Oh, okay. I genuinely have no <laughs> idea. But great question. If you find out, you can let me know. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. No problem. Good to see you. I was just going to ask about an individual project. Yep. I don't need to tell me now what email you but if you don't know now, but like, I was just going to ask what kind of like projects you've done in the past, just as some level of like, understanding of what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, so, are you, you're not waiting to tell me, right? I was going to say, I'll get you away.